You are listening to the Cycling Podcast at the Giro d'Italia in association with Rafa. The fastest clothing in the World Tour, the home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as they partner with EF Education First and Canyons Ram. Today we are in Pinerolo. I won't say it's only in cycling. We're basically every sport that a Slovenian athlete competes, we're at the top, which is basically amazing. We have such a small pool of sports people. Of course, uh, I can tell you for today, we will have the first thing in the sports news, we'll have Jan Polanz is in pink jersey, the whole uh, story behind today's stage, and then we have like 20 seconds, but there's still doping going on and the pressure on our riders. But I would say that we are still giving more thought and more time and more m- mainstream places in our news coverage to the success. Well, that was Slovenian TV journalist Zizka Leziak, the Slovenian Daniel Fried, you could say, talking on the day when Slovenian Jan Polanc took the pink jersey from his teammate Valerio Conti. And Slovenian riders are now first and second on GC because Primoz Roglic is still second. Polanc leads by four minutes and seven. Quite a momentous day for the Slovenians. But where are we, Lionel, and who are we with? Well, we are... We're in Fausto Copy country. No, still. we're not. We're oh, not. We we're not. I, kn- I knew I'd catch you unprepared on this tonight because you've been, you've been very frantic. You've been flapping the last hour. It's been t- it's been a tough day, and you haven't been looking at the map. We're in Cavour, and uh, very famous in Italian history because Camillo Benso di Cavour was basically the guy who unified Italy with Garibaldi in the 1860s. The reason I've been flapping, Daniel, is because time's ticking on and I've been waiting for you to do your research on Cavour. Um, but we're, we are joined by uh, Richard Moore. Welcome back to the Giro, Richard. I can't believe didn't know all that stuff. Lionel, <laughs> come on. Pull yourself together, basic, man. Basic. Time for you to go home, obviously. No, I've still got three more days after this, Richard, but we're, we're united for the whole weekend, aren't we? The, the full team here for the three, well, two and a half mountain stages or two mountain stages and a, a mini tour of Lombardy. Um, you've been watching the Giro at home, Rich? Well, it's been good. Them, it was good of them to start racing again today for my return. I appreciated that. I have been watching a lot of it, actually, uh, which the last couple of days wasn't a great decision. Um, it's been pretty... <laughs> The podcast's been really good, though. You've done really well to make it sound interesting. Uh, no, it's been it's been the best thing about well, the we Giro for me. But both Napalm and I were discussing this the other day, and we think that you you differ from us on this. That we don't really get bored generally in life. It's not something that we really experience because we we're probably both naturally introverts and we're understimulated. Where so we're overstimulated, and you're understimulated, and you look for you you probably get bored quite often. I actually, no, I don't get bored. I wouldn't okay. say. I mean, next I, item on the agenda. I, I'm just, I'm just saying the racing was. This sounds like an interesting discussion. I'm going to have to hear more about this. But the, the, the racing has not been very interesting. That's, that's just an objective fact. That's not an opinion. This is the worst theory, Daniel, since Richard's egg and banal theory at the start of the it's race. It's not definitely true. <laughs> anyway, um, on the subject of Slovenia, in the third part, we'll be hearing a bit more from. Zizka Lesiak, the Slovenian TV journalist. Is he the only Slovenian here on the race? I understand that his crew is the only Slovenian crew here at the moment. Well, they've got a big weekend ahead with uh, Polanc and Roglic first and second overall, but also um, this doping investigation, Operation Andalas, which uh, started off being centred on sort of Austria and Germany, and now the the epicentre seems to be moving towards Slovenia a little bit. Uh, We'll talk about that in the third part of today's podcast, but first, I suppose I'd better do a tale of the tapper. Really, we've been a bit slack on that because there hasn't been an awful lot of tale to tell for the last few days but today well what happened a lot happened because the pink jersey as I say moved shoulders but stayed within the UAE team Emirates team Valerio Conti is now third overall Paul Anch is in the lead Roglic is still kind of the de facto leader of the Giro I guess um, but it's uh, Paul Anch is a dangerous man to allow into that position I would suggest because he won the stage on Etna a couple of years ago he's also won a stage at Abatoni uh, a few years ago and uh, there was another big move on GC which was by Astana's Miguel Angel Lopez 
Superman. And Movistar's Mikel Sup- Landa. The poor old Colombian journalist, the poor old Colombian TV crews that are here, they don't get much joy out of Superman. Um, you know, they've come all the way over from Colombia, and really, he's the one guy they want to talk to. And um, it's, it's not... It's it's quite challenging for them every day. He's um, hard work, is he? He's quite hard work. Yeah, yeah, well, he had his mask on when he made that attack, didn't he? Um, Mikel Lander went with him. They went clear on the Montoso climb, the, the biggest climb of the day. And then they, would, they had a teammate each, which enabled the four of them to really put pressure on the Roglic, Vincenzo, Nibali group. And although they only gained 28 seconds at the finish, it does indicate that Roglic and Jumbo Visma and Nibali and Bahrain Merida are going to come under a lot of pressure in the coming days but the stage was won by Cesare Benedetti of Bora Hansgrohe the subject of our kilometre zero yesterday it was a thrilling battle for the stage as well because a big group of 25 riders got clear early on there was a period in the middle of the day when Sean Bennett of EF Education First and Marco Haller of Katusha were clear of all the rest um, they were caught with around 40 kilometres to go and then it began to kick off on the Montoso. The riders who came to the fore included Dario Cataldo, Damiano Caruso, Eros Capecchi, Eddie Dunbar, the young Irish rider with Team Ineos, Gianluca Brambilla and Jan Polanch. And that was the sort of first phase of setting up the finish. And really the first big decision was made on the steep climb in Pinerolo itself. Sorry, can I ask a question? Yes. Balkan Mollema, P-Watch. Did did this happen? Was no, anybody? No, we're attention? not sure. We'll find out. We'll find out tomorrow. Uh, because this was, I mean, it said it all about the Giro. The most interesting uh, thing to look out for today, we thought, was whether Bakamala would stop for to answer the call of nature. I mean, very surprised to hear Daniel be the source of this information. <laughs> Given yeah, it was information that I received and delivered quite reluctantly. <laughs> I know I could not bet you, but I'm, I'm I'm intrigued to know whether he did actually stop and uh, put this plan into action. To be fair, he probably didn't need to, did he? Because I mean, um, it didn't have to be that. He could have stopped for any other reason. He could have stopped at the auto grill or the you know like we do every day. <laughs> yeah, for a fatty furbo. Yeah, uh, um, <laughs> back ordering a fatty. That would have furbo. got his heart rate going. <laughs> Oh dear. Uh, well, well, we'll we'll talk about um, the the GC riders uh, a little bit later. But the stage itself was sorted out by Brambilla of Trek going very hard on that short climb. Capecchi of De Kernin Quickstep reacting. He was really the only one who could go with him on the climb. Eddie Dunbar bridged across to them over the top. And as they got into the final kilometre, Caruso and Benedetti caught up, which meant there was quite a curious sprint, really. They, it all came together at the moment that it needed to open up as a sprint, and it was Benedetti who was the strongest, his first Grand Tour stage win. Bora Hansgrohe was third of the race. Caruso was second, Dunbar was third, and Brambilla fourth, although he also had the consolation of taking the King of the Mountain jersey from his Trek teammate, Ciccone. And Britain's Hugh Carthy of EF Education First is now in the white jersey as best young rider. Just a brief list of, of GC riders whose hopes have uh, been dealt a bit of a blow today. Davide Formolo, Bob Jungles, Theo Gagan Hart and Sam Oman all lost 224 to the Roglic group. So very much a Slovenian flavour to the Giro tonight. The fastest clothing in the World Tour. The home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as they partner with EF Education First and Canyons Run. Thanks to Rafa for sponsoring the Cycling Podcast. It's that time of the week again. We need your nominations for the Pedaler de Charme competition. Any charming pedaling or gestures or anything that's deserving of a Pedaler de Charme t-shirt. The Pedaler de Charme and Pedalers de Charme t-shirts and jerseys are all available at rafa.cc. I actually brought an extra Pedaler de Charme t-shirt with me, partly because I heard that Daniel was wanting to wear one the other day. I didn't. But he didn't. And uh, also, there have been a lot of requests for Gianni Savio to get us an ordinary peddler de charme. Now, he likes dark-coloured T-shirt, doesn't he, underneath his shirt? He, he often At the wears moment, a, he's going with a dark... Uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've no, co- he I actually copied him today, you might notice. <laughs> I'm trying to channel Gianni Savio here, but I brought a spare T-shirt, so um, I think it's been a good Giro for peddler de charme nominations, if nothing else, so far. Surely uh, Savio should have a Pedaler de Charme suit jacket. Well, I'll tell you what. Can we get one made up for him? <laughs> I'll tell Breast you what. pocket badge. I'll tell you what, since we're talking about Gianni, should we hear what he had to say? And what was his strategy for the stage in his home region, Piemonte, today? Gianni, I've just heard you compare uh, Androni Giocato di Sidermec to Atalanta. Yes. Atalanta has been the big revelation of Serie A this yes. year. They're going to be in the Champions yes. League. Yes. Why this comparison? 
For the reason that uh, Atalanta, for a question of budget, uh, for Atalanta it is necessary to sell the best football player. And so sell to Juventus, uh, Inter, Milan, Roma. And for us uh, it's the same, because uh, the best football uh, player in Atalanta and the best uh, riders, Antonio Giocato di Sidermec. So, Egan Bernal to Sky, Ivan Sosa to Sky. Next year, Fausto Masnada to, I don't know, but uh, in uh, World Tour. The same uh, for uh, Mattia Cattaneo. And uh, so, I am in train now to discover other young riders. I hope that uh, there will be good young riders. So if you're Atalanta, what is the model or what's the formation for today in the Gianni Savio stage? We're in your region. Today is a race very, very original. So today there are no model, no schema. <laughs> Because all the riders today, not uh, the, maybe also the two uh, men in the classement, Masnada and Catana, but all must uh, try to enter in breakaway, all. And so when uh, all try to go in breakaway, the modulo is uh, eight, <laughs> finish, <laughs> you understand? Eight attackers. <laughs> yes, eight, eight attackers. Because uh, today many, many, many people want uh, to go in breakaway because uh, It's possible that today there are two races uh, in the same stage. One uh, for winner of the stage, other for overall classment. Gianni, one last thing for one of our listeners who's asked for a restaurant recommendation in Turin. <laughs> Give me the name of a restaurant that people should visit in Turin. Uh, I don't know, I don't know uh, exactly. So, uh, one, uh, one restaurant... Uh, Near my home is Birilli. Okay. Birilli. Ristorante Birilli. Ristorante Birilli. Yes. So, Napalm, there you go. Uh, Ristorante Birilli. Uh, no link to Ivan Basso's dog. <laughs> I, don't, I hope, anyway. I saw Ivan yesterday. I saw Ivan yesterday. Um, I, asked him about, I always ask him about his blueberries because you know he has a blueberry farm. He says um, uh, the, the harvest is coming up soon. Well, Savio's formation didn't quite work today. They weren't in the mix, really, were they? Well, they had a Montaguti was in the mm, break. True. Do you know what I noticed at the finish line? Um, how many other riders were were delighted for Benedetti winning? Um, Montaguti made a point of sort of uh, muscling his way through the swarm of, of Bora Hansgrohe soigneurs and, and journalists to, to get to Benedetti and congratulate him. Um, spoke to a couple of other riders who made a point of saying that Benedetti really enjoyed really deserved that win today yeah he's popular i think that came across in our kilometer zero episode that uh, he's popular with teammates but also popular within the bunch what came across is, is what it's a lot of assuming humble guy really grown up with that team and as we've seen the last couple of days he does he, you know he's, he's a he's a helper as he described himself he's a helper and uh fantastic timing to have the club zero come out and him win the next day but it's it's his first win so he doesn't do it at all until today so yeah it's uh, incredible and what about uh, well Eddie Dunbar I thought was re really impressive not just to get in that break but then to uh, basically keep his powder dry a little bit on the steep climb perhaps knowing that he couldn't go with the other two who really sort of went hard on the, the top of that climb this is what Eddie Dunbar of Team Ineos said at the finish I'm a bit disappointed really I felt like I was one of the strongest there. I knew I wasn't the quickest, but I was certainly one of the strongest, and uh, I just gambled in the finish. Um, I had Brambi and um, Eros there, and uh, I knew that being Italian, they were going to be a bit more keen than me to get to the finish, so I gambled on that. I got caught by the two guys behind. Um, that's bike racing. Um, live and learn, I suppose. It didn't feel super, and um, I was just worried about kind of what gear I was going to pick, and uh, I thought, right, if I start at the back, I can see who's strong. Um, and normally guys can, um, when they're feeding it on the climb like that, they ease back quickly. So I waited, um, kind of took in who was strong, um, and I knew, right, if I get to the top two, um, there's a chance. And I did that, but just came up short. And there's just literally who could push the biggest gear, and uh, as I said, I think um, the other guys uh, 
probably have that experience on me and um, that extra bit of uh, endurance, but it's a, it's a start for sure for me. So a new pink jersey, Daniel. How long do you reckon Polanch will keep it? Four minutes and seven ahead of Roglic. Well, I think he should keep it to until tomorrow. I think tomorrow the the stage will be won by a GC rider. I think that some of the teams went for well the, the classic kind of bridging tactic today, which was kind of the obvious thing to do. And you look at the, the riders that Movistar put down the road, Sutelin, who's their best time trialist, um, and he was there obviously in case Lander or someone else attacked um, Karapad and um, he was going to sort of pace them on that flat stretch leading up to the final climb. That's what happened. And Boado is probably Astana's best ruler, and he did that as well. Interestingly, Astana also sent back Dario Cataldo, who wasn't that far back on GC um, this morning, and I think he was slightly disappointed that he got sent back, but... You know, he's a guy a bit like Benedetti, who is very much respected for being selfless and, and a great worker. But um, yeah, tomorrow I think we'll see a, a big GC battle and they'll be going for the stage win. Um, that said, I think Polanch can probably keep it till the rest day. I think he can probably survive. Well, wow. maybe that's too much. Maybe tomorrow's stage, yes. The the following day stage in the Val d'Aosta will be trickier. Yeah, because that's short and very likely to be very aggressive. And, well, we've seen already the way that Lopez and Landa are going What gonna... is this, Lopez? When did this? When did we introduce this into the house style? S- Spider-Man. It's uh, Superman. Superman. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, he climbed that, he climbed that uh, hill like a spider trying to get out of a bath, didn't he? <laughs> very, very effective. It was, a, it was a fantastic sort of attack, having... Star Rider and the, the Standard Rider both having a teammate there, Lopez and Landa. But uh, they had about a minute and a half at one point and it looked you know, it looked like they could do some some real damage. But what what was interesting was Buaro and Schutelin were the riders, they were the only riders working on the front, and Landa and Lopez were were sitting on. Now, that makes sense in a way, because they're obviously saving energy, but would it not have been a good idea for all four of them to just give it everything at that point? They've got a gap. There's not that far to go. Um, they've had a you know a couple of of pretty easy days. They, uh, they weren't coming through at all. Well, they were latterly, but for a long time they weren't coming through, and and the gap was kind of closing, and it closed eventually to almost to just under thirty seconds. But there was a bit of uncertainty behind because obviously Roglic was isolated. There were guys trying to get him to contribute, which he wasn't going to do. So, uh, yeah, was, I mean, I've just w- seen Nibali c- criticise yeah. Roglic for not contributing, which, yeah. uh, you know, th- I never understand this no. when, you know, it's clearly in Roglic's interest not not to collaborate at that point. And, um, you know, just out of some kind of duty to share equally with the work. I, I mean, I, I he was getting a hard time from a couple of, well, at least one EF education first rider as well for not coming through, which, yeah, it's crazy to expect him to do that but it was notable that there wasn't a great a lot of cohesion behind and I just thought at that moment with four pretty strong riders up the road it's a waste of an opportunity not to have Lopez and Landa also giving their all to that now I could I, I might have missed that but from what I could see of the stage they, they weren't really contributing to that until later on when the two domestics had gone Am I right in saying that Lopez had had a puncture on the run-up to the Montoso? So the fact that they were so committed, Astana, to this tactic, because Jan Hurt was one of the first riders to um, make an effort on the climb, and then Lopez made his big effort. So maybe maybe that was a factor. Maybe it didn't all work absolutely perfectly to plan for them. But credit to them for committing to it and, and giving it a try. But what we saw behind was that Jumbo Visma really melted away a bit, didn't they? And that must be a concern for Roglic, because he's going to be riding this Giro pretty much on his own in the last hour of all of the big stages and possibly more. Well, they did. The last rider, uh, last domestique um, of um, for Jumbo Visma, who was on the front when Superman launched the attack, which really smashed them to pieces, was Kern Bauman. Um, I spoke to him at the finish today in Pinarola. Uh, no, I'm not worried. Yeah, if like the really big names, if they attack, then probably all of the GC guys are alone, or maybe with one guy. Of course, we're gonna miss uh, Geesing, who was uh, who was not able to ride here, and uh, Lawrence Plus. Who quit? But uh, I think still, uh, still in the mountains, we have a quite decent team to uh, to ride. And uh, yeah, if they really attack each other, then it's up to uh, to Primos. And I guess you could you sit up today. Once you were dropped, you could take it fairly easy. Actually, we rode quite uh, quite hard. 
the car just passes at the end of the descent and yeah until there uh, we have to go full gas if something happened with Primus we will be first and uh, not the car so but when uh, the car passed then it's okay for us and uh, yeah come back to the finish so that was Bauman Napalm trying his best to sound sanguine about the whole thing and but you know I was I was interested to hear what he said about not sitting up because my instinct was immediately that um, okay when he got dropped then at least he told hook and um, Sepp Kuss could could have a bit of a breather and they could, you know, rest up for tomorrow or sort of fall back into the Gruppetto or maybe not that far back, but kind of cruise in and um, at least conserve some energy for tomorrow. However, they they were told to stay as close as possible to Roglic in case he had a problem. Um, so, you know, they won't have, they won't have um, cruised through the last... 30 or 40 kilometers of today's stage um i think they do look weak still we've said they will be weak um i know antoine tolhoek was quite aggrieved with some of the things that have been written in the dutch press about them being weak i mean roglic got through today said after the stage he didn't feel great but it was it was enough in the end how much of that do you think is this the the rumble going round the starts the last few mornings is that today would be a nothing-ish day there would be a break and you know no perhaps no one that dangerous in it and that the gc riders would just ride over over the climb i, I, I can't believe that anyone really believed that i mean this layout of today's stage with that big climb in it we gave the stats yesterday of the climb and how the average gradient maximum gradient and it was a really difficult climb and um it was it was set up perfectly for exactly what we saw a break to go down the road with rulers in it and then for the captains to bridge and that's exactly what happened i mean with hindsight i'm quite surprised that for example i spoke to matt white mitchelton scott a couple of days ago and he didn't think that much was going to happen i frankly i don't really know why no well they kept calm didn't they they didn't really do much Simon Yates didn't we didn't see him get involved at all um, Matt White made the point this morning that even though he's three minutes 46 off the pace at Simon Yates you know and and wants to make up that ground doesn't need to do it too doesn't need to be too eager and do too much too soon because whether you're 30 seconds down or three minutes 46 down you've still got the same amount of energy to spend over the remainder of the race and that's quite an important point especially when the rider himself will no doubt be really keen to get on with it and perhaps tomorrow will be the day we see him go or certainly the team go from early on well, Napalm, uh, one encouraging sign for them was Esteban Chavez being in the lead group. Um, I spoke to him after the finish. You look pretty cool and you looked as though you were fairly easy on the climb. Not easy, but you look pretty comfortable on the climb. Yeah, but I'm not. No. One thing is inside, another thing is outside. Yeah. And was Mikel Nieve kind of rested today because he wasn't with you guys on the climb? <sighs> he, will, he will back in the climbs. You know how strong is this guy. Yeah. And for sure... In the coming days, he will be an important part for the team. And Simon was good? Yeah, really good. So Chavez was up there. Um, he, he told me that he didn't feel too great when he was when he was um, trying to stick with the best guys. But um, I was I was curious about Nieve today. Um, the fact that he wasn't in that group when everything that we've heard has suggested that he's um, absolutely flying at the moment. Was he being sort of rested? Um, are they kind of rotating the domestics? I think tomorrow they'll go for a long one. I think um, someone will go down the road, whether it's Nieve or or Chavez, and I think um, Simon Yates will make his move tomorrow. Shoot, uh, shoot at the du peloton, cycling podcast team car at the back of the pack please that's Seb PK interrupting our Giro coverage to remind me to tell you that this episode is sponsored by the award winning OS Maps you can plan your next adventure with OS Maps for just £2.99 a month you can get all the Ordnance Survey Maps for the whole of Great Britain across your devices so you can look at them online or you can print out the maps if you prefer to carry them with you plan adventures create experiences get out there and explore you can find new walking cycling and running routes and create your own routes as well and view drone like footage of your route with 3d fly throughs and explore what's around you with augmented reality so you don't need to miss a thing when you're out and about plus download and print the maps with your routes before you go so if you're out somewhere remote in great britain you don't need to worry about losing your phone signal and not being able to navigate around and i think that's something about maps that they started off as these kind of unwieldy paper foldy outy things yeah maps are not what they used to be are they clearly um I, i'm kind of learning this from listening to the cycling podcast <laughs> line the last few days uh, but these are not my when i think of os maps i 
I can picture them all kind of uh, in the bookcase um, with the spine and the number and you know often you would keep the collection together and have it running consecutively uh, but with all the the new sort of technology that there is now it's interesting what what maps have become and what maps are and it's not it's not that traditional uh, as you say fold the out fold the outy thing and yet the os maps when you look at them online they have exactly the same house style they are the same maps they're the, you know they they're so they are so clear you can almost see them without having to look at them you can see them in your mind's eye and you know whether you're looking at you know a land ranger or one of the more detailed closer up maps um but yeah i've still got a collection of maps at home so that all that cover the whole area that i used to cycle in when i was uh, when i was growing up it's a very good offer, isn't it, Cycling Podcast listeners? It is. Get a free seven-day trial at osmaps.uk or download the app from the App Store or, as I say, pay just two ninety nine a month and get the entire Ordnance Survey maps on your devices. Ronchi, 2015, anche un buon rapporto qualità prezzo, anche buono. the hipster option or is it something that you would rather go for something more tried and tested napalm? I mean, what? we're already going off the, a bit off the beaten track with it. They're quite wooded. This is going to be relative to a normal one by race car. Or do you want to go hipster? Okay. Yeah? Allora, eh, assaggeremo gli... Come si chiamano? I ronchi? I ronchi. Va bene. So, Nepal, this is a Barbaresco, one of the great Italian wines from the Nebbiolo grape. Barolo is slightly more famous. That's just up the river from here. Slightly Barbaresco is a slightly lighter... Um, the grapes ripen a bit earlier, um, slightly more delicate, less less tannins, kind of less. It will sort of attack your gums a bit less than a Barolo. See what you think. Okay, well, cheers. Cheers. One of the highlights of our Giro. Yeah, so good. Oh yeah. You get that wood straight away, but then it really that tails off quite quickly. It's very fresh flavour. It feels a feels pretty drinkable, which is slightly concerning but then maybe or maybe i find all wine quite drinkable well daniel last night you posted a picture on twitter of me enjoying my glass of barbaresco wine um not as aggrieved about that as the picture of me in front of the fatty furbo menu meal deal some, at the services you did some nice nebbiolo offsetting this morning you went for a nice run uh, in the vineyards of barbaresco didn't you it was stunning wasn't it around there the, the the hillside is absolutely as far as you can see it's vineyards isn't it and they're so neat so ordered um looks absolutely stunning Lange hills um if anyone wants to go on a lovely little mini break or um you know to a slightly less well known certainly for English-speaking tourists and part of Italy, the Piedmont and the Alba area. Well, Daniel, looking at the results today, anything that stands out to you other than uh, the people who are right at the top end? I mean, Eddie Dunbar, of course, for Team Ineos, but Team Ineos had a sort of mixed day, really, didn't they? Well, they did. I think uh, Theo Gegenhardt's been struggling for a few days um, after he, his crash in the first week. Um, Pavel Sivakov, I spoke to yesterday. Um, Sivakov was the big sort of stage race phenomenon that's, that's then Team Sky um, hoped they were signing last year. He had really cleaned up in his last year as a, an amateur. He'd won the, the Tour de l'Avenir, the Giro de la Val d'Osta. Um, Rich, you know him quite well, don't you? Have an interesting background. His dad was a professional cyclist, a Russian professional cyclist, um, born in Italy, raised in France, speaks perfect English. His mum was a professional cyclist as well. Correct. Yes, we heard from him, didn't we, in the father's episode of Kilometer Zero last week. Um, and he, yeah, he grew up immersed in cycling, surrounded by cycling competes for Russia which is interesting because he was born in Italy brought up in France discovered by Nicolas like Portal like I said you know if you're listening so I did switch <laughs> off for a moment there I was busy watching a Marco Haller video on my phone um, wow I, I hope you're going to raise your game a bit in the coming days I mean you're, this is hard isn't it being just sort of dropped in it's like being asked to ride the last 50k of the stage Give me a chance. Did you did you say he rides for Russia there? No, I didn't say he rides uh, for Russia, but the, the whole the yeah, rest of his okay, biography. That, that's the I, bit that I'm quite interested in. Oh, okay. Um, because, uh, you know, I wonder if that was a difficult decision for him because, you know, uh, he's... Is it a definitive decision? Well, he's, he's because there were, I know there was a bit of... Uh, yeah. There was uncertainty at one point a couple of years ago whether he would declare for France or Russia. He rode for Russia at the Worlds in Innsbruck last year. Met him at the airport, actually, in Innsbruck on his way home. But... Yeah, I, get, I wonder if it was a, a, a difficult decision for him or whether the family ties uh, mean that writing for Russia is a way of 
uh, of acknowledging that. I don't know. Well, Rich, he rode well today. He stuck with all the top guys um, over the Montorzo climb, and I spoke to him after the finish. We talked yesterday about how you how you thought it would go. It went pretty well, no? Yeah, I was a bit surprised actually. I felt really good in that climb, and uh, yeah, at the top uh, we saw some attacks uh, from uh, Maika and Nibali, and uh, I felt like in the Tour of Alps a few weeks ago it was really a tree. Just missed there. I, it was a good day for me and a good day for the team with uh, Eddie as well in the break with Nizi, who did a really good job, I think, for Eddie and for me in the final. So, no, good day, good day for me. So, do you feel that today you've got an idea now of what the level's like in the mountains and where you can maybe be in that in that kind of group? Yeah, it was a little idea, but I guess the real the real thing will start tomorrow. You know, today was, uh, OK, it was super hard, that, that climb, but it was only one climb. Tomorrow we'll have uh, several climbs with a much harder stage uh, already before. So, uh, yeah, I think the big, big test is tomorrow. But already I think it's going to be those guys who we saw today that will be in the front. So, no. so a good day for Sivakov, uh, winner of the Baby Giro, of course, a few years ago. Uh, not such a good day for Bob Jungels. And that really surprised me because... Uh, I thought he was in his element here at the Giro. Certainly at the start of the year, he talked about how much more comfortable he was here that, compared to the Tour de France. But today was not a good day for the Luxembourg champion, was it? No, and we expected that some guys might struggle today because it's the first big climb. We've talked about this a lot over the last few days. It might take a few um, a few days for some of the riders to kind of settle into a different kind of ride in different gears. Um, different muscles that you use when you're climbing and so forth. So, you know, this might not be a, a definitive sort of fallout of the general classification for young horse, but it wasn't very encouraging, was it? Anyone else on... Uh, Formolo is out mm. of general classification, I think, unless he, he can get into a break um, at some point and reposition himself. Um, Carthy continues to impress. Very much so, yeah. Carthy is still in the top ten. Um so um, Peo Bilbao my hot tip for um, as, as a dark horse in the Astana team was slightly disappointing today he slipped down a long way now he's in 43rd place overall so not looking great for him I also thought Sam Ullman was uh, you know going to well, this was an opportunity for him with the Moulin gone uh, he rode extremely well at the Giro last year um, and Slightly disappointed to see that he wasn't in that in that main group of chasers today. He was in the group behind. So uh, it's been a bit disappointing to me, Rich, to hear that he's not really going for general classification. I think it could be another th- three or four Grand Tours before he gets another opportunity. But the Dutch journalists I've spoke to have sort of said, well, he came in knowing that he wasn't going to ride for GC. He was going to help Tom Dumoulin, and he and he's not wanted to really to sort of reset his goals. The Cycling Podcast at the Giro d'Italia is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you to Science in Sport for sponsoring the Cycling Podcast. All of our listeners can get 25% off the whole range of Science in Sport products. Go to scienceinsport.com and enter the code SISCP25. Richard, point of order? stockpile your science and sport products now for thursday the 26th of september because that is the inaugural cycling podcast i don't know what we're calling it ride it's the world championships no oh yes in association with the world top brewery in east yorkshire that's world championship week by the way uh, we're doing a bike ride followed by uh, a buffet dinner and a cycling podcast live event the, us the three of us will be there we're hoping to get some special guests what? along as well what? Daniel what? Luke's surprise don't pretend that you don't it'll start in the morning with coffee and a, a 75 kilometer bike ride led by La Corsa uh, mm-hmm. fully supported not, bike ride this is not me and uh, tickets go on sale tomorrow Friday uh, at 11am it's £60 for the day and as I say that includes the ride which is fully supported Andy Mackey and James McCallum, the former professional rider, is uh, our, they're our leaders there. Then we will do the we'll have a cafe stop, of course, for Daniel. Then we'll have a buffet dinner, and then there'll be a cycling podcast live event. Um, the World Top Brewery are an East Yorkshire brewery. It's a grain to glass brewery. They have their own farm, their own barley, water source, and wind turbines. How do people get tickets, Richard? <laughs> That's a really good question, Lionel. The people will get tickets. Go to thecyclingpodcast.com. 
and events and you will be able to click to the link to get tickets there the cyclingpodcast.com events uh, I, tomorrow night I'll have news about the next batch of uh, cycling podcast Giro mugs as well obviously I'm a bit disappointed to finish second but if I think about what I went through at the start of the Giro I have to consider it a good day there'll be more chances before the end of the Giro for me I'm sure there was never any question of sitting up to wait for Vincenzo they gave me carte blanche on the radio like I said I'm disappointed not to have been able to give the team the gift of a stage win but I gave it everything in the sprint my group came from the back and I'd also been suffering a bit with the heat I couldn't really get going because I had cramps anyway I'm happy Benedetti won he deserves it he's a great worker and a true pro so Napalm, that was uh, Damiano Caruso, who was second today, had a very tough start to the Giro, a horrible first week, he was sick, he's obviously recovered, um, but it's been a bumpy old ride for that team, hasn't it, Bahrain Merida, because they lost uh, one of their riders, Christian Corrin, they lost uh, um, a direct sportif, um, Borat Bozic, who, I'm not, was he actually at the race? I can't remember whether he was, but he's um, he has been caught up in this, um, well, it's been described widely as an Austrian doping scandal, but the doctor in question is actually a German. Um, it's the, the code name that's given to the investigation is Operation uh, Anderlas. And um, overnight, or yesterday evening, there was a story published by our colleague, the cyclist, news about um, a UCI investigation into a gentleman called Milan Erzen, who is a Slovenian, um, who is very influential at Bahrain Merida. Um, and he is kind of internally referred to as the managing director of the team. What he actually is, um, is the link man between the Bahraini prince who, um, I think it's three years ago now, wasn't it? And wanted to set up a world tour team and the operation itself, the the, the cycling team itself. Um, Erzem was a bike rider. Um, the, the, the An allegation has been published that Erzem um, bought uh, or wanted to buy a centrifuge which could have been used for blood transfusions um, but also could have been used for other other things but he wanted to buy it um, from the German doctor at the centre of Operation Anderlas and we are expecting a statement from Bahrain Merida about Milan Erzen at some point this evening. But that's not come through yet and this has kind of been rumbling on for a few days and we've seen a few riders and past riders um, get caught up in it and the, the sort of the, the the implication has been that this is kind of historic, but clearly it's it's its tentacles are stretching further into the the current peloton, is, isn't it? That seems yeah, to be what's and, happening. And I think increasingly people are amalgamating all the Slovenian riders, and they're also quite understandably drawing a. a a link between the current success, this incredible current success and that they're experiencing with Roglic and then Polanch in the in the pink jersey today. And, and then, you know, also historically over the last 15 or 20 years, Slovenian cycling has come from nowhere. And the first Slovenian to ride the Tour de France did so in the year 2000. There were actually two Slovenian riders that rode for Vinnie Calderola that year. And since then, and particularly in the last three or four years, they've become a real a real power in professional cycling for a country of, I think, just over 2 million people. So, you know, there's plenty of dot joining. You know, I think it's it's unfair to group all of the Slo- Slovenian riders together. Jan Polanch was asked about um, Erzen in his press conference tonight, and he said, well, you know, I barely know the guy. Um, I'm coached by my dad. I took, took a different route um, from a lot of these other Slovenian riders. And, um, you know, just how involved was Erzen with guys like Primoz Roglic? Um, he was certainly involved with the team Adrian Mobile, um, in which Roglic started his life as a as a cyclist really um, not even a fully fledged professional cyclist he was he was riding some pretty lowly you could almost call them amateur races when he was at Adria Mobile and what's the reaction from uh, the Slovenian journalist who's here obviously to cover Roglic's success and now he has the Polanch story as well but is uh, Jizka Lesiak following this story as well or is this not really on the radar in the Slovenian media I'll tell you what Lionel let's hear from him again shall we we are a sporting phenomenon in every sport, it's not just cycling, but at the moment this is the big thing. Um, I know there's a lot of talk about doping and with all that happened in the Nordic um, Championships earlier this year, but I think that it came out intentionally to put, to put more pressure on our athletes and I don't think that was the right thing to do. Really? You think uh, uh, how would that have worked? Well. 
you know, every time now that Primoz comes before the media, he doesn't want to talk about this. I mean, they're, they're constantly asking. He wasn't part of this. Well, at least now that we know, we hope that he's not part of this. But I think that it's unnecessary pressure. They could have waited, you know, let's finish the Giro. Okay, they had to expel Koren. If he was with that, he's at the moment cycling at the Giro. Okay, you need to go. But you mean the UCI announcing or telling one website that they're investigating Milan, I said. Yeah, exactly like that. And that, I think, it has that negative point on that. And I don't think that us as journalists should be asking Primoz or Jan, for that matter, you now in the press conference, they were also asking him about that. I don't think it's fair about them. I mean, enjoying their victory. I mean, ask him, how did he do it? Why is he so good? Because this is a team sport. After all, many people don't know that cycling is a team sport, but it's a huge team sport. And let them, let these guys do their work, enjoy, and then let's after that, let's do the affair or whatever. I guess it's such a small country, and I think I'm right in saying that two th the year 2000 was the first time a, a Slovenian ever even rode the Tour de France, and now there are so many good Slovenian riders. And I think in people's minds, people's imaginations, they think that because it's a country of two million people, all of these guys, these Slovenian guys, they've come through exactly the same system, they all know each other, they all know the same people, and they, th they think... Milan Ezen is the center of all of this. Yeah, I would I would know that exactly because um, let's say I, I've been with cycling for the last 10, 12 years. But Primoz, for example, he didn't come from these. I mean, he was like... He, he rode for Adria Mobil. Yeah, no? he, he rode for Adria Mobil, but he was an amateur then. I mean, I don't think that they introduced... I think the guys who work with these kind of things, with illegal things, I'm, I won't say that I'm definite, but I'm sure they tried. But coming from a sport like Primoz did, from a completely different sport where the rules are so strict, like in ski jumping, where doping control is every athlete after every event, I think he would be smart enough to not undercome under this pressure. To be honest, I don't think the Slovenian media didn't know about him until yesterday. The mainstream media, I mean, probably the, the, the few cycling specialists who we have, who work with cycling, you know, like the... Um, Hauptmann and uh, the guys who run the national team of Slovenian cycling, those guys probably knew about him, but he wasn't that uh, mainstream in the media. Okay. He, w he wasn't known. Okay, so, so last thing, um, when you, I, I guess you're compiling your reports from today, another Slovenian rider in pink, another rider, Bro Roglic, who might win, and then this other stuff going on. What's the balance like in the coverage? How much is being given to the successes? How much is being given to the failures? And what kind of resonance is it having? How many people are watching? How many people are listening? Yeah, well, uh, Roglic became the, a phenomenon like with the Tour de France stage wins and the fourth, year last, uh, fourth place last year. And that's when cycling in Slovenia really got back on there. But I have to say for our new station and for mostly... When we report on doping, uh, we have like the sports section in the news is separate to the hard news. So the hard news usually goes for that story or even the late night uh, news shows, they go for that. But in sports, we only cover success. I mean, that's also, I can say, vouch for my news station um, and for my editor. He is more for success than doping. Of, of course, uh, I can tell you for today, we will have the first thing in the sports news. We have Jan Polanc is in pink jersey, the whole... Uh, story behind today's stage and then we have like 20 seconds but there's still doping going on and the pressure on our riders but i would say that we are still giving more thought and more time and more m mainstream places in our news coverage to the success yeah, it's interesting there lionel um it almost sounds as though there's a bit of ambivalence in in slovenia um it's going to be interesting to see how this pans out over the next few days and one of the journalists who's been working hard on this story is Marco Bonarigo for the uh, Corriere de la Sera and I think he's got more information that's coming in the next few days. Um, I've been looking back through the archives um, seeing if I can sort of link this to other scandals and um, Borat Bozic so he was the former, well, I think he last rode for Cofidis did he? Or he was a lead out man for Cofidis but he rode for a whole series of teams in the noughties now um, is a 
or was until he was suspended about a week ago, uh, Bahrain Merida, director sportif. He appears in the Padova uh, Michele Ferrari investigation of uh, a few years ago. And there are a, a few other interesting things that appear in that particular dossier, police dossier. Um, Leonardo Bertagnoli, who is a retired rider, um, who was quite prominent in that investigation. And there were, there were tapped phone conversation between Bertagnoli and Ferrari in which Bertagnoli talks about a Slovenian supply line for um, the drug ICAR which um, you know, was sort of m- rumoured and, and mythologised for a while that this drug that was going to make people lose weight and that was possibly being abused in the professional peloton and um, those suspicions were never really verified um, but in that investigation, there were certainly quite a number of Slovenian names mentioned. But, you know, I think it's very easy to, as I say, amalgamate and the whole of the Slovenian peloton. Um, they haven't all come through the same teams. They haven't all got the same network, the same coaches, the same doctors and so forth. Well, we'll be following this as it, if it rumbles any louder than it currently is over the next few days. Um, just just a final point as well on that, Lionel. Um the, the people might imagine uh, a link and it's it's legitimate i think to to imagine that there might be a link between um, Milan Erzen and what he's been doing and Vincenzo Nibali Nibali being the most prominent rider at Bahrain Merida um i think it's worth pointing out though that since that team's inception there has been two quite distinct blocks there's been the sort of slovenian croatian block and there's been an italian block that's that's really um crystallized around nibali and it's been a bit of a storyline over the last two or three years that the two blocks have not necessarily always got on and they've been quite independent of each other well as i say we'll keep an eye on that but uh, we've got three more big days of racing over the weekend i'll be handing well, I won't be handing a bat on back. I'll be handing the mic back to Richard tomorrow. Um, we'll do a Madison hand sling in the afternoon and you can you can take your place at the front of our three-man peloton again. Hopefully it'll be a mic that works on my mic tonight, but that's why I've only been dipping in and out because we're down to two mics. Because we're, we're going to overlap for a few days. We are indeed, yes. The whole team together until the next rest day. So until tomorrow, thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you, Lionel. And thank you, Richard. Thank you. No speak, she go, no. Se lo mangiano le femmine.